wait to get started with resin. We've got everything all mixed up. I'm all ready to go to start my first project. This is going to be great. That's definitely not right. And it's also not my first time working with resin. To be perfectly honest, this one happened about halfway through my journey to this particular point in time. My name's Foxy. I'm a multidisciplined artist and I love exploring new things and that's what led me to resin. Uh, what I wanted to do was to create figures that were submerged and looked like they were, were like in uh, an aquarium tank. And my first attempt was a sea dragon and uh, didn't turn out so great. But because I persevered, because I did some learning, I actually ended up being able to turn out something like this. So I'm here to share some of my experiences working with resin and to give an idea, a walkthrough of how to work with different types of projects to achieve different types of goals. I hope you'll join me on this web series going through all of this and learning to do projects yourself on resonating through art. So let's first look at what you need to get started. What is resin? Resin is liquid plastic mixed with a hardener that produces an exothermic reaction as it cures. Okay, okay, enough science talk. This means the process produces some heat. The more you mix, the hotter the cure gets. That is an important detail. Resin comes in various types. Epoxy is one of the more versatile and simple to use forms. They will always consist of the resin and the hardener, which must be mixed together. This substance allows for artists and crafters to produce a wide range of works and applications. Many will start with readily available kits in the art and craft stores. The smaller bottles are easier to handle when first learning. If epoxy resin proves to be something you want to dive into, there are various formulas and suppliers out there, many that offer less cost per fluid ounce, though be aware they usually sell in the gallons. As long as you use it within the shelf life, you'll be fine. Let's explore my collection. Store kits often have selections in the 16 to 32 ounce bottles. Per ounce, the cost is a bit higher than buying in bulk, but it is easier to sample different formulas to see how each works before commencing building your kingdom of crafts. Once you know what works for your needs, pour it away. Always make sure to read the instructions and not push the properties of the type. General purpose resin for casting and coating works for a variety of applications from coasters and thin pours to small figures. It is a one to one mix ratio by volume. Getting a water clear cast in this resin is tricky, though more advanced. That's for a later tutorial. There is a risk of a flash cure if trying to pour too deep. This is where too much heat is produced and it can't escape quickly enough due to a volume or a taller narrow mold. The cure will be bubbly and quite hot during the process, sometimes hardening in a matter of minutes versus the hours it should. Used properly, it is an economical multi-use resin formula. When larger bottles prove harder to work with, smaller squeeze bottles are a great alternative. Crafting or condiment bottles work. Just make sure you can seal them. Clearcast 7000 resin, also for small castings, is a one-to-one -one ratio by volume that is thinner, allowing for more bubbles to escape over the cure time. Many of the more specialized formulas will cure harder and with fewer micro bubbles than a general resin. They're a bit pricier per ounce, so I tend to reserve their use for certain projects, like the 3D fish paintings. Also something I'll be showing you in time. Tumbler coating resins are thicker, one to one ratio by volume, allowing them to cling and dome on a surface to give a beautiful, high gloss top coat. Hard curing or resilient, these work great when you need to coat or smooth something out. You know, cover a scratch or a flaw. Though I tend to use it more intentionally to seal acrylic paintings on resin projects. Due to the viscosity, this is not a good selection for doing deep castings. The bubbles will be a problem if you try to go too thick. Floral deep pour resins are a different formula. These tend to cure producing lower heat over a longer time. They are also typically a different ratio, in this case 1 to 3, requiring 1 part hardener to 3 parts resin. The viscosity is much, much thinner, allowing for bubbles to work their way out of the resin over a longer period of time. Be aware that the securing time can take days. You will have to be patient, so there is a trade-off. There are many other brands out there with even more specific uses depending what you want to achieve. 
So when you are ready, take some time to see what's out there. Aside from resin, what else will you need? Something to make. So molds will be good. Resin will take on the form of whatever it is placed in. Most molds for resin are made out of silicone. They come in a wide range of sizes, shapes, and purposes, from practical to just plain fun. You can find a selection in craft stores that sell resin supplies and a plethora of molds online. And if you get really industrious, you can even make your own. However, in the interest of successful casting, it's best to start with ready-made molds when first beginning. Preferably a wide, shallow one as the deeper narrows are harder. We'll get to those in a later video. When molds are not in use, store them in containers or plastic bags out of the sunlight to keep them from drying out. You'll also need containers to mix in. Always use smooth-bottomed round containers for mixing. Measuring cups with marked portions are essential. Either plastic or silicone are reusable with proper cleaning. Non-marked cups work great for separating out portions for coloring. And if you've used it for making resin, don't use it for food. Keep those separate. You don't want to accidentally eat resin flakes. Mixing implements. There's a wide range available online at Orin stores. Silicone makeup brushes, small silicone stirring sticks, large kitchen scrapers, even plastic tongue depressors. All work great. Take care about using wooden ones to stir. The porous surfaces can add bubbles when mixing, and bubbles are already a resin maker's bane. Though I'm sure you'll try to keep things clean, resin tends to be a messy medium. For cleanup, have paper towels and 90% rubbing alcohol or wipes on hand. I have both. Wherever you work on this, make sure you're okay with an accidental smear of resin. So, not on the family heirloom dining table. In my case, I pour in a workshop, but I still have the surfaces covered with wax paper and or silicone mats. Silicone releases resin with relative ease. Wax paper is a quick and disposable second guard. Also be aware that if liquid resin gets on fabric, it is nearly impossible to remove it. Don't wear anything really special while working with resin. A heat gun will also be helpful with removing bubbles, but it is not a requirement. Be cautious when using on silicone molds as it can melt them. Coloring resin is a lot of fun. Micro powders are wonderful for adding metallic, satiny sheen. This is by far one of the easier substances to work with. It also hides a lot of small bubbles. They come in a wide range of colors and companies that supply them. Glitter can also be added as well, and a variety of small items like sand, metal foils, shells. Just make sure that whatever you're embedding in the resin is dry. Water causes a number of issues including clouding. Alcohol ink can be added to resin to tint it in everything from subtle to deep shades. However, it is harder to get a clear bubble-free casting in resin without a lot of experience and a secret. Work with mica powders first to get the hang of the process. While not essential, pre-warming the resin to the curing temperature range will assist in mixing. You can make a box to do this with a heating unit and the temp gauge. I store mine inside one so it's always ready. Or you can use a warm water bath and set the bottle in them for a few minutes. Make sure no water gets into the bottle. The curing temp is also critical. Too cool and it will be too rubbery and sticky. Too warm and it can flash cure with lots of bubbles. To prevent this, you can create a hot box. This is a small chamber that is heated, in my case a 10 gallon tank with reptile pad heaters and a temp gauge. Using this I can keep the curing resin in the 70 degree range that is ideal as well as protect it from dust. This is helpful in areas where temperatures fluctuate out of the curing range. Impatient and ready to get started? Not so fast. There is a critical warning. Resin is a chemical reaction. This reaction creates not only heat but also fumes that can be problematic. Protecting yourself is important. Make sure you read the instructions for your resin before using it. Do not mix resin and then sleep in the same room while it cures. Over time, an exposure and allergy can develop that affects the lungs. But proper precautions can prevent that. Work in a space that can be closed off from residents, kiddos, and for kids. It should be a well-ventilated area. If needed, use a fan, either installed like a shop fan or one blowing out the window. While mixing or working with curing resin, wear a chemical respirator and disposable gloves. Wash off any resin that contacts skin as soon as possible. Children can select the mix-ins and help design, but they shouldn't be in the room with the uncured resin. This is for their protection. Thanks for watching. I hope you'll join me for part two, where I'll show you how all of this is done.